And with that, I want us uh, to come and study tonight a, uh, a, a topical lesson. And it's a topical lesson that I want us to spend several weeks on, three or four weeks. Uh, and it's the issue of law and grace. Law and grace. And as uh, we do so, I think that it is really an issue that has far more importance than we might think. And just over the last uh, few years even, as I have studied Scripture and uh, begun to take Scripture even more uh, literally in its uh, context as well, I've uh, realized that there is a lot of mixture that we give between law and grace. And all of this mixture really brings about a great deal of confusion. And uh, if you have your outline, I have given you four or five uh, uh, just bullet points points that I think are, are uh, among the issues that tell us why it is so important to understand where is the division between law and grace, where does law belong, where does grace belong, and how do you bring all this uh, into it. But how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, you just, I want you to think about this for a moment, how many of you have ever had a doubt of your salvation? My, my hunch is that if I were to have a show of hands, it would be almost every hand here. That somewhere along the way, we, we begin to wonder, well, am I even saved? And often when we come into these doubts of salvation, it has to do with a misunderstanding in our own mind about law and grace. Not always, but very many times, it is a, a teaching of the law that has been uh, uh, given to us, causing us to wonder about our salvation. For example, Matthew chapter 7, do you remember? Jesus says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, uh, you, you preach that one really good, and all of us are going to be scared, right? Because how, how did we come into salvation? We called upon the name of the Lord, and uh, calling upon him, you know, I, hey, I said, Lord, Lord, I'm the one that has turned to him. So am I going to be saved? And we begin to say, well, is this, is, uh, is this confession of sin that I've made, this asking for forgiveness, this asking for eternal life, is that sufficient? Or am I one of those who's not going to be saved? And of course, as we begin to uh, look at it then, what, uh, what do we begin to do? We'll say, well, only those who keep his commandments... And then we begin to think about all of the commandments of the scripture, all the commandments of the law, all the commandments of the Lord. And how many of you uh, get an A plus on keeping them? I don't see any hands. <laughs> B minus, maybe, <laughs> you know, okay. Uh, and so, that, you know, we, we begin, of course, to worry. Or a few, a few weeks ago, I was preaching from Matthew chapter 12, and I had to, uh, uh, I had to finish the sermon before I finished the message. How's that? Uh, and at the end of that particular passage in Matthew chapter 12, it talked about how if you do not forgive others, then you will not be what? Forgiven. Okay. Uh, is there anyone here, again, you don't have to raise your hand, but is there anyone here who's had a hard time forgiving someone else? Well, if you have and you look at that and maybe you're really struggling with the hurt that someone has given to you and you say, you know, the truth is I don't think I have forgiven them. I certainly haven't forgot it. I know that. And I haven't released them of that. And so, have I even been forgiven? You see, you can really begin to doubt your faith when you begin to mix together law and grace. And so, these doubts of salvation is one of the issues. The second issue uh, that uh, makes this important is that uh, to correctly uh, distinguish between Israel and the, and the church is something that I think uh, is, is easily accomplished when you understand law for Israel and grace for the church, and you're able to put these together where you're not uh, mixing these. We'll see some of this as uh, we go along tonight. Uh, and the third point, uh, knowing what to do about the Sabbath is solved when law and grace are rightly divided. Now, I, I have to admit here that I understand that our society today has largely moved beyond this and doesn't, doesn't have too many scruples over it. But many, many of you grew up in a day when it was... Uh, 
it, it was rather uh, challenging to figure out what you could do on the Lord's Day, which we called the Christian Sabbath, right? And uh, in fact, when I moved to Texas, it still had the blue laws, you know, and uh, I came from uh, New Mexico and uh, I guess we were more liberal over there because we didn't have blue laws. And so when I moved into Texas and we had blue laws uh, and uh, first time I ever went to a Kmart that was closed on Saturday, I thought, what in the world, a closed Kmart on Saturday? No wonder they went out of business, right? But actually they were closed on Saturday because of blue laws. Because they figured out everyone else is closed on Sunday, but you only have to be closed one day of the weekend, according to the blue laws. So they closed Saturday and were open Sunday. So it was a very busy Kmart on Sunday. Nobody else went to there any of the rest of the time. Uh, but uh, there were those, you know, it closed the businesses by state law. Now, what is that? That's a, that's a Judeo-Christian ethic that came out in the laws of the state of Texas. And, of course, uh, it, uh, it wasn't sure what to do. And, of course, you, many of you remember, well, are you supposed to go out and eat on Sunday? Is that, is that legal? You know, is, are, are you going to be uh, frowned upon if you go out to eat? Did any of you grow up, uh, you know, sort of worried about going to a restaurant on Sunday? I thought so. Uh, did any of you go to a restaurant on Sunday? <laughs> I see some no's, and then I see some sinners. <laughs> well, it, there was a day in which you would have been considered a sinner had you gone out to eat on, on Sunday. Now you're just considered a Baptist. Uh, but what do I do about this? You know, am I, can I mow the lawn on a Sunday? All these things that are, again, they're not so much issues as much in our society today, but they certainly have been. Uh, but even the, the, the issue of the Sabbath itself, we talk about the Christian Sabbath, but it, it, it really is almost a, an oxymoron because the, uh, the, the Lord's Day, as we call it, is on the first day of the week, and there's no way you can call the seventh the first, right? And Sabbath means the seventh. So uh, should we be worshiping on Saturday? In fact, uh, one of the things I was most surprised at when I became a pastor is that one of the most consistent questions I was ever asked about the Bible is, are you sure it's okay for us to worship on Sunday? Because the Bible says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And it's very clear in the law that you, you, you do whatever you want on the first day, but the sixth day uh, of the... I'll get it right. The seventh day of the week, that is a holy day that is to be set aside and you're not to do any work on it. You, your manservant, your maidservant, your family, all of that uh, is, is clear there. So what do we do on the Sabbath? Well, uh, if you understand this issue, it's really not a problem at all. Or uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, there's a, a, a passage of scripture that we've uh, tried to make say something that, uh, we tried to make it not say what it actually says. And what it actually says is, repent and be baptized unto the forgiveness of sin. And that just bothers us, doesn't it? And so we say, well, you know, he just really meant this, that, the other, and we, we, uh, we, we, we work our way around it. But the truth is, it says, repent and be baptized ice unto the forgiveness of sins. We've got to figure out this thing of law and grace and a proper understanding of law and grace, and then the problem of Acts chapter 2, verse 38 goes away, as we've looked at it when we studied the book of Acts. Uh, Christian stewardship, I think, takes on a completely new meaning when you understand law and grace as it uh, comes along. And you put all this together. So there are really a lot of implications that this issue of law and grace carries out along the way. Now, I do believe that the issue of law and grace and the separation or the understanding of the two, it really is a foundational biblical doctrine. On your outline, I've given you some passages of scripture, which we won't go through and look at all of them. I'm just going to, again, take them just the little piece of the verse that I've used, I would encourage you to go back through and read the larger context in Romans chapter 6 and 7 or the entire book of Galatians, and you'll get the bigger picture. But I want to grab uh, just, just some of the, the uh, Twitter theology. How's this? I want to grab just some of the sound bites as it comes along, and you go back and uh, check to make sure I'm using this right. But you see how foundational it is as you see these words of Paul when he says in Romans chapter 6 verse 14 that you are not under law, but you're under grace. How many people didn't understand that? Very clear, isn't it? And yet, how many of us have come along somewhere and put ourselves under law? We've done it before. Maybe it was on the Sabbath. 
uh, that, uh, that we amended to be the, the first day rather than the seventh day. And we said, well, you, you know, you really are under the law. And he says, no, you're not under the law. So are you under the law or you're not under the law or are you kind of under the law or are you completely out from under the law? What is it? Well, he says, you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Romans chapter 7 verse 6 says, you have been released from the law, having died to that with which, uh, to which, by which you were bound. Looks to me, again, that's very clear, isn't it? That uh, there is a release. You're dead to it. It's done. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. A man is not justified by the works of the law. Now, justified is salvation. And uh, so even in the Baptist way of using the law, probably would say, well, well certainly no one is uh, uh, saved by the law or justified by the law. But look, it goes on in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to say, are you, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 3 says, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now, perfected is not, uh, not justified, is it? Justified, that moment of salvation, you're not justified by the law, but you're also not what? Perfected by the works of the flesh, which in the context of Galatians chapter 3 is by the obedience of the law. So, you are not saved by the law, nor are you sanctified by the law. In fact, he says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, as many uh, as are of the works of the law are what? Under a curse. As many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. There are two uh, possibilities of the meaning there. And, uh, and, and, and I think actually both of them are true. But it says that if you are one of those who are putting yourselves under the law, you're putting yourself under a curse. Because the law is a curse in, in many ways, as we'll see over the next uh, few weeks. But I think it's also to say, as many as are of, of the works of the law. Now, don't look at that necessarily in terms of people under the works of the law, but let's look at it in terms of the laws themselves. There are, uh, what, according to the Pharisees, 613 laws. And of those 613 laws, how many of them are a curse? As many as of are the works of the law, number 613, number 522, number one, whatever it is, all of it under the law puts you under a curse. Now, the, the, the uh, issue there as you, uh, as you look uh, through, and if, again, if you were to read in the context there, you would see this uh, come out in Galatians chapter 3, that the, 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 the sometimes uh, desire that we have to divide the law up and uh, say, now this is the part we're still under, but this is the part we're not under, and this is the part we used to be under, and this is the part he's under, and this is the part she's under, and, and uh, I'm going to pick this one, and you pick that one, and all this division we do of the law really doesn't work. As many as of are of the works of the law, it's all uh, of a curse. And the law is, uh, is such a complete totality that I'll just let you know right up front, I completely reject that uh, teaching that says, well, it's the ceremonial law that we were released from, but not the, uh, not the moral law, for example. I happen to think that we're dead to the law, we're not bound to the law, we're free from the law, we're not under the law, all of it completely. I know that makes you a little bit nervous, right? Uh, because, uh, you, what, you mean we're free from the moral law? I mean, uh, I, this might not be a, way, a good way to say it, but it's a memorable way to say it. Uh, you're, you're thinking, my goodness, if he keeps teaching that, they'll be having drunken orgies before sundown. Being free from all the moral law, right? You know what I found over the years? Those who most strongly believe they are free from the law and saved under grace live the most moral lives because they are awestruck by the grace that has been given to them. And under grace, they live beautiful lives. In fact, they're more generous people than those under the law. Those under the law move the decimal point over one, one place to the left and, uh, and, and give it, you know, down to the penny. Those under grace give as God has purposed, as they, as they have purposed in their own heart. They give cheerfully. They recognize that God loves a cheerful giver. They give not under compulsion. They come and they 
They, uh, they give thinking of the unspeakable gift that is uh, in Christ Jesus, and that is their motivation for giving. So, uh, there, as many as of our other works of the law, they're under a curse. Now, I want to uh, share with you a little bit of a work that was done in 1649 in a book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity. The Marrow of Modern Divinity. Think about that marrow. It's the, uh, the essential uh, uh, nature. And even though Edward Fisher, who is believed to the, be the one who wrote this, it actually, the author just just uh, said he uh, he just used his initials E F, but we believe it's a a, a man named Edward Fisher. Now he was a Calvinist, and uh, so there are a lot of things I would disagree with him on. Uh, but he had this uh, marvelous view, I think, of the law and saw it as the marrow, the very the very lifeblood, if you will, of modern divinity. That is modern holy living. Here's the substance of it. And so in 1649, here's what he says. He says, it is very needful for us to be well instructed in the difference betwixt the law and the gospel. It sounded so good I decided not to even change it. Uh, Got to know the difference betwixt the law and the gospel. And he gives uh, a number of reasons here. He says, uh, if, if we don't know the difference, he says, being ignorant, number one, we are apt to mix and mingle them together and confound the one with the other. And I think that many, many, many times what you see in our world today is uh, people who are preaching what they think is the gospel, but actually it's the law. And, uh, and so they'll preach the law and they'll call it the gospel. They, they, uh, they get these mixed up. And that's uh, so often, as again, we've seen over the last uh, number of uh, months here, as we've been looking through uh, the teachings of Jesus, and you can take the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you can take uh, the uh, rich young ruler, uh, on and on you can go in these. And if you, if you take the gospel and preach it out of those, then you're really going to, uh, to, 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 to mix and mingle these together and be in trouble. Number two, the knowledge of the difference between law and gospel will, he says, afford us no small light toward the true understanding of Scripture, and it will help us to judge aright of cases of conscience and quiet our own conscience in time of trouble or distress. That is a nice way of saying it's going to set you at ease. It's going to help you to understand uh, what, what, what do you do in these cases, cases of conscience as it comes along uh, with your uh, ham sandwich as it uh, may be or bacon for breakfast? Number three, we will know where we find law and where we may find the gospel written. We will know when the law speaks and when the gospel speaks. Now, that's very close to what he said in number one, but uh, one of the things I've been saying over the last uh, several weeks, and I always uh, hesitate just a little bit when I say it because it's so easy to be misunderstood, uh, but uh, I've been saying that if you want to read the gospel, don't look for it in the gospels. You can't have the gospel without the gospels, but you don't find the gospel in the gospels. What you find is the foundation for the gospel in the gospels, and the foundation is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But where do you find the gospel? You find the gospel when the age of grace comes about. Uh, you find it, uh, it, just to make it easy, you can find it in the Pauline epistles, uh, like uh, uh, even uh, as, uh, as Paul talks about how uh, the Lord was uh, buried and, and uh, he, he died for our sins. He was buried uh, and uh, on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And it's by grace that you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. Uh, you can find it all through the uh, Pauline uh, uh, epistles. Uh, but in the Gospels, you'll, you'll, uh, if you apply that, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so as you come then to number four of Edward Fisher's points, he says that if you know the difference, then you'll not apply the law where the Gospel is to be applied. And uh, as, uh, where is the Gospel to be applied in modern divinity, by the way? It's to be applied in salvation. It's to be applied in sanctification. Salvation and sanctification are things that are not ever going to come from the law in, under modern divinity. And uh, the lifeblood is realizing what, uh, what goes where. Now, I want to speak about uh, a, uh, what, what I think is a common mistaken view. And uh, I, uh, I'll use a, a few quotes uh, from uh, Dr. Alan Street, who writes this book, Heaven on Earth, which uh, I, I, I disagree with early. But... Uh, 
I, I want to share some of the things, and, and I think what, the, the, what Dr. Street does is make a, an incorrect assumption about the kingdom, and, uh, and, and, which is the, what the book is about. And so he comes to a chapter on kingdom responsibilities. And uh, uh, here's the section called The Law and the Kingdom. Here's what he says. Jesus affirms strongly that the law is still in effect and binding on God's people. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because you might immediately uh, disagree with what he says. Jesus affirms strongly that the law is still in effect and binding on God's people. You might, you might disagree with that because I've set it all up for you here and you say, no, uh, you know, Paul uh, comes along and what's he say? You're not under the law, but you're under grace. You're released from the law. You're not justified by the law. But actually, in that one very statement, I'm going to agree with Dr. Street that Jesus does affirm strongly that the law is still in effect and a binding on God's people. You know why he affirms that strongly? Because the law was still in effect and binding on God's people. When Jesus was there, he was speaking to people under the law. Jesus spoke to the whole house of Israel, and they were under the law. The age of grace had not come. Jesus never said anything that was not said to those who weren't under the law. So, Jesus didn't come along and say, hey, I got a new song I want to teach you. Free from the law, oh, happy condition. I have bled and there is remission. He didn't do that. They were under the law. He taught them under the law. He said uh, to the Pharisees, this you ought to do because it's a part of the law and uh, you ought to carry out the law. Now, uh, he, uh, uh, the, the book goes on uh, to say, uh, it quotes uh, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he says, with these words, Jesus dispels any misconceptions some people may have about his opinion of the law. Evidently, a rumor is circulating that Jesus has come to destroy the law and set it aside. He goes down uh, later to say, the religious leaders are the ones responsible for distorting and destroying the law. As God's spokesperson, Jesus will elucidate the fullness of the law so that people will see its potential to impact the lives, their lives and community. Now, if I'm interpreting that correctly, what he says is the uh, Pharisees had so uh, twisted the law that Jesus is going to come and he's going to teach it in fullness so that people will recognize its potential. Now, the problem is, what does Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 say about its potential? As many as are of the works of the law are, what? Under a curse. That's its potential right there. So there's not a sort of a new understanding of the law that Jesus is going to bring. It would still be a curse. He goes on uh, speaking uh, 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 later on. He says uh, in Matthew 5, 18, uh, which talks about... Uh, uh, not one jot or tittle will pass away. He says, here Jesus gives assurance that the law will remain intact and in effect until God's plan for the ages is complete. The law has a purpose in God's end times plan. This means that the law is still in full force today. That's, that's uh, his teaching. The law is still in full force today. I, I, I don't know how he... Uh, brings that up with what Paul uh, says. And I think the problem is he's missed this age of grace that has been inserted as a mystery. And uh, he has carried the age of the law, which was indeed in Jesus' day, and which will be indeed in the days of the tribulation in the coming kingdom. And he's put those together, failing to pull those apart and insert this age of grace. And so thus he says the law is still in full force today. Now, if the law is in full force today, how many of you broke the law this morning at breakfast? We have several. <laughs> uh, bacon eaters here. Uh, pork eaters. Uh, now, I, I suppose Jesus gives a fuller meaning, a fuller revelation somehow of our understanding here. And, and it goes on to say, the problem is not with the law, it is good, but people do not interpret and practice it completely, uh, correctly. Uh, it goes on to say, then Jesus, gives the, 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 then Jesus gives the result of the cheapening of the law. And this is what he says the Pharisees have done, is, uh, is, is they cheapen it. So, he uh, quotes again from uh, uh, Matthew um, 
uh, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then uh, Dr. Street goes on to say, the whoever in, these ver- in this verse are the people of God. Remember uh, the first uh, set of bullet points there? The very number, bullet point number two, correctly distinguishing between Israel and the church. Uh, He says that whoever in this case is the people of God. That's right, the people of God if you're talking about Israel. But it goes on to say how unfortunate for professors, pastors, and Sunday school workers who lead others astray uh, as it relates to the law. So he... He, uh, he, he mixes, again, Israel and the church, professors, pastors, and Sunday school teachers. We're all this one people of God, the church and, uh, and Israel, all together. Later on, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees observe the law, but not as God intended. Through their traditions, they creatively twist the law to suit their fancy, and in doing so, they transform the word of God into the word of man, which carries no divine authority. Those calling themselves disciples of Christ who do the same will find themselves outside the kingdom. Now, he's talking about people today there. Those who call call themselves disciples of Christ, who twist the law, don't obey the law, will find themselves what? outside of the kingdom. Well, goodness, I wonder if I'm saved then. Because I'm not going according to the law like he is. Uh, Outside of the kingdom is where I'll find myself, according to Dr. Street here. He he goes on to say, uh, two things should be gleaned from this passage. I'll just give you one. He says, first, Jesus is God's authoritative interpreter of the law. Jesus is God's authoritative interpreter of the law. Uh, In in the year 2000, Baptists changed their faith statement called the Baptist Faith and Message. And we took out a statement that had been used by liberals to come in and and, uh, uh, just go almost anywhere. And the statement uh, was this, Jesus is the criterion by which we interpret Scripture. Jesus is the criterion by which we interpret Scripture. Now, doesn't that sound an awful lot like Jesus is God's authoritative interpreter of the law? And uh, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a very problematic statement. It goes on to say, Jesus is less interested in formalities and rituals and more concerned about one's inner motives and the hidden intent of the law. How do I know that, by the way? That Jesus is... Is, uh, is less interested in formalities and rituals. When, Dr. Street had just quoted the page before, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so. Doesn't sound to me like he's uh, uh, not so concerned about the formalities of the law. Sounds like he's very concerned about uh, the formalities of the law as it uh, goes along and as uh, we begin to carry that out. Now, I, I say that because that really is a very common view. Uh, it's a view that there, there is in, in, in kind of a reinterpretation of the law, but nonetheless, the law is in effect today. And so we better study the law as if it were for us and apply it to ourselves. Here's uh, another one. This one comes from Dr. R.C. Sproul, you've likely heard of, uh, and uh, it's on your outline as well. And he says this, if we have no obligation to keep the law, which is what I've said, by the way, if we have no obligation to keep the law, how does the law drive us to Christ? That's, a, that's his question. Let's stop right there for just a moment. Because uh, I have uh, taught you a whole bunch of times, but I don't want you to forget that you should always question the assumptions. And he's got an assumption in this question, doesn't he? How does the law drive us to Christ? What's his assumption? That the law drives us to Christ. And uh, if we have an obligation, if we, if we have no obligation of the law, then the law couldn't fulfill that, uh, that, that, that role of driving us to Christ. Well, we ought to ask, and, and the only place we can ask really is the scripture, does the law drive us to Christ? Is that a purpose of the law? Uh, Now, let's go on in his statement. He says, if it, the law, if it shows us our failure, are we then not called to succeed? Again, there are some assumptions there. Assumptions that the law shows us our failure. And 
If it shows us our failure, so we say, oh, I need Christ. Then the assumption is, well, if it shows us our failure, surely we need to succeed in that which it showed us, right? And uh, he's, trying to, he's, he's, he's building what is a logical argument on a flawed assumption, I think. Uh, as uh, it goes on, he says, not only do I not understand why someone would feel the need to toss one use of the law, that is telling us what God requires, in order to protect a second use, showing us our need for Christ, but I, I don't see how one can even be preserved without the other. Now, my whole point is I wouldn't preserve either one of them because I think that you're not under the law, but you're under grace. You're not bound to the law. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're not justified by the works of the law, nor are you perfected by the works of the law. Uh, that uh, you, I, I don't even believe you're driven to Christ by the law. And uh, uh, so as you uh, begin to uh, con consider uh, these uh, and you question the assumptions here, do we really need to preserve either one of these uses that he gives? The law just doesn't, uh, I, I don't think it uh, doesn't tell us what uh, God requires of us, nor does it show our need for Christ. Uh, I like uh, the words of Myron Houghton, who wrote, writes a, a good book on this. Uh, he's a professor at Faith Baptist uh, uh, Bible College and Seminary in uh, Ankeny, Iowa. Uh, and he writes a book on law and grace, and he says, the law says do, the gospel says done. And uh, the, this, uh, there really is this great difference between the law and, uh, and the gospel. So I think Sproul's got an, in, uh, an incorrect premise. But all of this, given uh, that these are very common teachings and assumptions on the law. Now, with that, let's look at a scripture just uh, briefly here, and that's Galatians chapter 3, verses uh, 23 and 24, where Paul, again, I'm having to pick up in the middle of a context, but he gives a, a good word here when he says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith that was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Now, let's uh, just walk through that and uh, think about it for a moment when he says that before faith came. Uh, has faith come, by the way? Are we in an age of faith, uh, so to speak? Sure, say by grace through faith, right? Uh, if you go back up into, in verse 19, by the way, it says, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, who's he talking about there? The Messiah, until. So the law was given then because of transgressions and uh, it was given until the seed would come. That is the Messiah. And taking that until thought down to verse 23, before faith came, that is before the seed had come, we were kept in custody under the law. Well, who's we? You have to back up quite a long ways to uh, follow this, but look in chapter 2, verse 15, and it says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. And the truth is that Gentiles were never, ever anywhere under the law. The law was for Jews. It was not for Gentiles. You could convert and uh, come under the law, uh, but... The uh, law wasn't given for Egyptians and Chinese and uh, Indians and all that. The law was given for the nation of Israel, and it had a purpose. So it was given before faith came. The Jews were under the custody of the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor unto Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we no longer, we're no longer under a tutor. So... The law had a purpose, and its purpose was for Israel. And its purpose for Israel was to keep them in custody. The law was the custodian. Or the law was, what's the other word that's used besides a custodian? A tutor. Uh, some of your translations might say something like a schoolmaster. 
Uh, and uh, it is, uh, 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 some of them might even say, a, uh, I don't know, a nanny or something along this, uh, this, this idea. But it's not so much the idea of teaching, that, uh, that particular word there, but rather it's the idea of protecting. It is the one who, uh, who takes the kids in the school in the morning and carries them or, or walks with them, uh, guarding them along the way until they get, get to the schoolhouse. Now, a, 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 let's use the word nanny here. A nanny will do that uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, for your, uh, for your kids. I know you're all extremely wealthy and all of you have, have and had nannies. Of course, none of us would do without it, right? Uh, but if you did have a nanny, uh, the nanny would take care of the little kids. And maybe, you know, as the kids got older, the nanny would have maybe a little bit different role. But maybe you'd keep the nanny. But what if you kept the nanny when your child was a 21-year-old college student and you sent the nanny off to college with him? Somebody would be saying, there's something wrong with that kid. <laughs> he is old enough now not to need a nanny. And here it says, the law was the nanny that did its job. And its job was to keep Israel intact. And because of sin, uh, I mean, just, just look, uh, uh, Moses has gone 40 days, and what's the nation of Israel do? Boom, immediately, they got a golden calf. Uh, and uh, just every chance they got, they were running every which way but loose. And so the law was very restrictive. And without the law for Israel, Israel just wouldn't have survived. They'd have been like all the other nations. And uh, they needed to survive for 2,000 years from the time of Abraham until the time of Christ. And so the law served a purpose to preserve Israel until the seed would come. Until the time of faith would come. And now that that time of faith has come, what's the use of the law? None. None. It served its purpose. It's done its work. It preserved Israel up until that point. And now that faith has come, there is no longer this need for the law. So it, uh, the, the purpose of the law was for Jews prior to the uh, revelation. By the way, uh, again, we often say that uh, the law is uh, used to, uh, to, to, to lead us to Christ. And we, we are using this passage right here that the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. By the way, you notice when I read that from the New American Standard, I left out the words that they inserted. It literally says the law has become our tutor unto Christ. Uh, so we take that and we say, well, yeah, the law leads us to Christ. Now, if the law leads us to Christ, who should be coming to Christ the most? Jews. Orthodox Jews. Because the law would lead them to Christ, right? And has it worked? If the law leads them to faith in Christ, it has been a miserable failure. But that's not the purpose. The law was for Israel to hold Israel together as a unit unto Christ. And now that Christ has come, there's not any need. So guess what? A Jewish person today who's living under the law is still living under what? A curse. And what they need is Christ. And a Gentile who wants to, even if they're a Christian, wants to come and put themselves under the law, they're, they're, you're not going to lose your salvation for it, but you're sure going to lose a lot of your joy for, uh, from it, and you're going to doubt your salvation many times, and uh, you're going to put yourself under a different kind of a curse. So as uh, we come uh, together, we get this uh, just, I, I think, a, uh, if we'll take this a clear understanding of the purpose of the law, we'll put it together. Now, I'm not going to uh, uh, spend any time on these grace principles, but let me just read the uh, major bullet points, and then uh, we'll close for this evening, and we'll pick up uh, next time on uh, some uh, further issues about the law and uh, grace. And I want us to see uh, some different means in which the law has been applied down through the years. How has the uh, Roman Catholic Church used the law? How's the Reformed Church used the law? How have dispensationalists used the law? And uh, put this together and come to an own under our own understanding and a freedom here uh, in, in our understanding of the law. But some grace principles. God never intended the law to be a means of salvation. Some scripture there you can look at. Proper biblical interpretation requires carefully and consistently distinguishing between law and grace. So as you open up the scripture and as you read and there's that clear law that you're given, uh, that's given, you need to ask, is this a law of grace or is this the law of Moses that uh, is being spoken of here? 
Third, grace becomes a new rule of life for believers today, and grace itself has specific demands. Uh, Spirit-controlled believers are motivated to fulfill the righteous standard of the law. God's discipline today is a training toward holiness, not an expression of his wrath as it was under the law. And then the judgment seat of Christ uh, becomes uh, for the believer then one of these days an awards ceremony. And we will uh, look at that in uh, times to come. So a little bit about law and grace. We'll have a good time studying it this uh, summer. And uh, uh, the truth will set you free and you will be free indeed. God bless you for uh, being here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're uh, grateful for your word, for the opportunity to come into your word and study it, and uh, to, to take a, a, a difficult issue like this that no doubt has brought uh, many questions into our minds as we've gone through this particular study tonight and, and as we will go through it. But I pray that we will be faithful to the word of God and uh, come to conclusions that are completely biblical through it all. And if I've said anything tonight that is not biblical, would you uh, help me in my study and uh, using these others to come to see that? over the next few weeks and to correct that and each of us if we have uh, adopted into our Christian life some means of the law that doesn't belong there would you also help us to uh, be set free from that so that we might know grace in its fullness I pray this in Jesus name amen